Yeah, hi everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some uh, beautiful points of contact between uh, complexity theory, game theory, and deep learning. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, several students, uh, 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 postdocs and collaborators, and I'll mention them along the way. Also like uh, I have uh, some slides I can, I can share later. Uh, also, I'm not sure how much I'm gonna go through my slides, but uh, you know, I'm gonna share them all and you guys can uh, read them also afterwards, uh, you know, and uh, more deeply. So, uh, okay, so, um, uh so you know as you know as, as as we all know as you all know uh reading through the news or interacting with these technologies machine learning has made a lot of breakthroughs in uh, uh recent years undeniably undeniably uh so uh and um um from an optimization uh, standpoint uh, there is a fundamental uh, change in how we think about uh, estimation problems. So, so a lot of, uh, you know, like a lot of uh, a lot of the applications you see here, from like uh, image recognition, speech recognition, to protein folding and and text generation, these are estimation problems in their heart. Uh, but but from an optimization standpoint, the, the the way we approach estimation problems related to to, to learning tasks. Uh, has uh, had has has seen a fundamental uh, change, and, and that is that we have left the nice harbor of convex optimization, and are uh, more and more considering non-convex formulations of our estimation problems. Uh, to, to 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 give some examples, um, uh, you know the classical least squares regression problem is uh, you know a very nice uh, estimation uh, setting where uh, you know you want to you want to find the best linear fit through your model through your points and uh, you can write this very nice objective uh, to do so uh, and that objective is convex in the parameters theta um, more broadly so this is an example of uh, uh, the more general problem of doing maximum likelihood estimation uh, in models uh, where your data is coming from an exponential family and there are no latent variables. If you, if you write the you know, negative log likelihood of in such an estimation problem, it, it is also a convex function uh, in the parameters theta that are indexing the uh, exponential uh, family distribution. So these are two nice uh, broad settings uh, where your estimation problem is a nice uh, convex optimization problem. Uh, in contrast, when you uh, train a deep neural network, as you very well know, the estimation problem is not is very much not a convex uh, problem. And in fact, you know, like dealing with non-convex problems is not like something new that came out of nowhere only uh, in the context of deep learning. Uh, if I may make a, 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 a slight but important modification in these uh, examples that I gave uh, upstairs and, and, and think about models that have latent variables, uh, in that case, very commonly, in fact, uh, uh, the likelihood, uh, the MLE problem becomes non-convex. Uh, and, you know, you have to use tools like uh, expectation maximization algorithm or variational inference uh, to... Um, uh, deal uh, to 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 practically heuristically deal uh, with uh, the non convexities that will arise. So so by no means some you know uh, this shift from convex to non convex optimization is something new, but is very much very important and very central in how we think about training uh, deep nets. Okay. Um, uh, and also, uh, of course, as you well know. Uh, you know, when, when, when my problem is a convex optimization problem, you know, the target of my estimation is to find the global opt. Uh, if it's a non-convex problem, uh, global opt is out of reach. Uh, it's an empty hard problem. Uh, so, you know, the target is finding some local opt. Now, you know, as I said, you know, non-convexities are not something new. Uh, but, but but like uh, uh, the important features of deep net training are the, the following uh, that are somewhat more new. 
Uh, so the parameter vector theta is very high dimensional. Uh, okay, so the function you're optimizing is non-convex. And also you have very um, primitive access to that objective. Like, so, you know, you have first order access, you can maybe query the gradient of the function, but like more, more higher order queries are more expensive. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you have at least you know, at, at least the gradient exists and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, your function is lipsits and smooth almost everywhere. Okay, so these are some features that are, you know, pertinent to the, to the deep network training problem. So long story short, uh, if you're dealing with such a problem, you don't have many options. Uh, you have to run a simple method uh, to, 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 to deal with the non-convexity and the fact that your variables are high dimensional. Uh, and you know, you, you're gonna run a variant of gradient descent. And you know, gradient descent uh, is not gonna find you the global loft, but you do have guarantees uh, that, you do have the guarantee that you at least not gonna get stuck at some spurious critical point. You are have the guarantee that you're gonna find the local optimum. And the empirical finding is that local optima are pretty good heuristically for many of the problems that we're interested in. There's no guarantee that the local optimum is gonna do a good job, but for many of the uh, learning applications that uh, we, you know, people have tried to solve, to solve the local optima selected by this method are actually uh, useful. All right. So people have been very excited about this new paradigm. And the following has emerged as a general framework to approach uh, uh, challenging learning problems. Uh, write a very complex model with millions or billions of parameters, collect a lot of data from out there, get access to a supercomputer and do gradient descent to try trying to train your model as well as possible on the data that you have. You turn the crank and you know you find a model. And oftentimes that model is good and you write your nature paper and you get your awards and you know like you're very happy, okay? Uh, uh, so the paradigm has been so successful that there are many frameworks that exactly provide you the ability to do this thing. People are so excited that you know oftentimes people say, okay, like scale is all you need, like, the more parameters I have, the larger supercomputer I have access to and so on and so forth, the better models I can build, okay? I'm, I'm not a subscriber to this uh, mentality of scale is all you need. Uh, I don't think scale is all you need. And um, I wanna talk about a, a set of applications where scale is not all you need, and we know that it's not all you need. And, 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 and you know, like, uh, 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 you know, like uh, 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 these, these types of applications arrived in the multi-agent world. Uh, so, 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 so as you know, a, a lot of, you know, emerging interesting applications of deep learning involve multiple agents, uh, you know, in situations like uh, games, like Poker Go, StarCraft, or in, you know, robot, robot interactions. Or in applications like uh, generative adversarial networks and adversarial attacks that are not explicitly um, uh, multi-agent, but where writing them as a multi-agent problem, uh, uh, you know, helps you arrive at uh, learning outcomes uh, that you cannot, uh, you know, that that you know, like uh, you know, you may not know how to arrive at otherwise, uh, or at least in any event helps you, like a multi-agent formulation helps you arrive at some uh, learning outcomes that are otherwise not multi. Uh, agent outcomes. Have you guys seen, you, you've seen uh, generative adversarial networks, right? I mean, um, maybe let, let me go through one of these motivating applications really fast. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in generative adversarial networks, the, you know, is one of these examples that are not a priori multi-agent but we're writing uh, the, the formulating a like li writing down a game uh, helps you arrive at the learning outcome uh, that you wish so in this case the learning outcome that you wish to attain is to uh, identify a neural network that is going to take as input boring randomness so multi you know isotropic gaussian samples 
and output interesting randomness. In this example, samples from uh, the distribution of celebrities, um, right? So I guess, I guess, you know, like the, I guess the, the idea here is that, you know, like God sitting wherever, you know, she is or he is, uh, has a nice distribution of interesting uh, from which God samples photos of like, like, sorry, humans that are celebrities, okay? And, and you don't like, you know, like we don't have a nice parametric form of how that distribution looks like, but we have some examples of celebrities like, you know, Tom Hanks and Jennifer Aniston or whatever. Uh, and okay, given those examples from the distribution that God sampled, we wanna come up with a neural net that generates samples from that same distribution that God is sampling. That, that is the idea. So, you know, we want to train, we want to find parameters theta for this neural net so that if we plug in Gaussian samples into that network, the output is going to be a very interesting sample. So like the samples you see here, which are all actually fake images, these are all hallucinated by some neural net that was trained on celebrity photos. And, you know, like it pretty convincingly generates, uh, you know, uh, photos of people who could, at least in my eyes, my non-expert eyes, be celebrity photos. Okay, so that's the goal. Now, how do you attain this goal? There are many ways to do so. Uh, one way is to actually set up a game and uh, um, set the game in such a way that uh, in the strategic interaction that uh, this game will uh, uh, will, uh, 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 you know, uh, ask the agents to engage in, uh, the outcome will be a nice neural network that does a good job at generating good samples. So what is that game? So you have, you have an agent who's controlling the parameters of the neural, the neural net that you want to create. So you, you have an agent that is controlling the parameters of the generator, but you introduce another player who's controlling parameters of a different neural net that's called the discriminator. And um, the goal of the discriminator is to receive as input samples that are either generated by the generator or uh, photos of real celebrities and, and distinguish the two samples. So, so you want the discriminator to say one if it sees a real celebrity and zero if it sees a fake celebrity generated by the generator. You want the generator to fool the discriminator in thinking that his samples are more likely celebrities than the real celebrities. So, you know, so you write a payoffs for the two players to try to express that. And, and here's one example payoff function you, you can write. So you can give the generator uh, a loss that depends on the parameters of the generator and the parameters of the discriminator, which is how, like the loss of the generator is the difference between the output of the discriminator, DW is the discriminator. So you, you look at the expected output of the discriminator when you input into the discriminator a real celebrity, and you subtract from that the, out, the expected output of the discriminator if you input into the discriminator a fake sample, which is created by sampling boring randomness and passing it through the generator. So the difference of these two expectations is the loss of the generator and minus that is the loss of the discriminator. So the generator is penalized if the discriminator says high on real people and zero on, and low on uh, fake people, the loss of the discriminator is the opposite of that. You have these two agents uh, play this game in the hopes that uh, in the outcome of this strategic interaction, the generator will actually manage to fool the, the discriminator. Okay, so that, that, that's an example application, an example multi-agent application. But I wanna point out two things about this interesting application. One is that the loss functions that the agents have are, are very non-convex, right? I mean, like in this example that I have here, you take uh, theta 
like the, like the payoff function, which is a function, the, the loss function is a function of theta, the parameters of the generator, and W, the parameters of the discriminator. Uh, you know, these parameters are indexing neural nets that are composing with each other. So this is a highly non-convex function. So these functions are highly non-convex and also these parameters are very high dimensional, right? Because, you know, these generators in general would have millions of parameters. So it's a very intricate and difficult game to think about. Uh, and in fact, games of this type where the loss functions of the players are non-convex do not have equilibria. So, so it's not very clear from a game theoretic standpoint, what one uh, ought to be to shoot for in, in this kind of scenario. So, so there are some issues. Uh, so like, uh, you know, these games don't have equilibria. So game theory doesn't have good proposals of one, what one ought to do uh, in this uh, type of interactions. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, like, I, I mean, there's no, principal way to think about these games. Um, yeah, so, and, and this is literally the motivation of, 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 of this talk. Um, so despite the fact that there is no clarity about the target solution, practitioners have nevertheless tried to solve these types of games. And the way that solve these games or they try to solve these games is by appealing to the not to their method of choice in deep learning, which is gradient descent. So what practitioners, without clarity, as I was saying, you know, there's no Nash equilibrium in these games, but without clarity about the solution, the target solution, practitioners have nevertheless been trying to use variations of gradient descent to solve these games. So what they do is they have both players run gradient descent on their own loss function. So the, you have, they have the generator run gradient descent with respect to their own, the generator loss function. Uh, and they have the discriminator run gradient descent with respect to the discriminator loss function in parallel. And they hope that if they run gradient descent for many steps in tandem, uh, the generator will arrive at uh, a good, you know, vector of parameter. Um, as it happens, this is very, very fragile. And, and here is uh, two examples showing how fragile it is. So, so in the first example, the target distribution, God's distribution, this platonic distribution that I'm trying, that the generator is trying to generate from, the target distribution is the MNIST, handwritten digits. So what you see on the right is what the generator is generating if you stop the training at different points in time. You, you know, you have, you have the generator and the discriminator around the gradient descent, and then you look at what the generator generates if you were to stop that process after 10K steps, 20K steps, 50K steps, 100K steps, and so on so forth. So what you see is that, you know, like um, in, in the first panel, in the first example, you see a phenomenon uh, where, where, where what's, that's called mode collapse, uh, where kind of like the, you know, the generator at, after 10K steps of training, it's generating a single symbol. You know, after 20K steps, it switches to a different symbol, but, but it's, there's no variation within what is generating. And also the symbol that is generating is bad. Like it's like some weird symbol that is not a digit. So not only there is no variation in what symbol it generates, but also that symbol is a completely weird symbol. And then you know eventually settles in this French B symbol and just generates that thereafter it doesn't move. In the bottom example, the target distribution is a mixture of Gaussians whose centers are arranged in a cycle. Here you have a different type of behavior of gradient descent in this kind of settings, where sort of like the, 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 generate, the discriminator is chasing the generator with switching modes. So, so if you stop the training process at different steps, you'll see that you know, like the generator is, is generating from a different mode of the target distribution, right? So like 
you know, like the generator is generating here, the discriminator catches up with him, the generator moves somewhere else, discriminator catches up, and you know, like they're changing each other. This is a very you know, common behavior of, of gradient descent in games where you know, like agents are chasing each other in the strategy space without ever settling uh, at, a, at, a, at an equilibrium. So long story short, um, there are many uh, uh, um, multi-agent applications, either explicit or implicit, uh, that, that are emerging in the field of deep learning. Uh, but there are issues when you try to use gradient descent to train agents in these kinds of settings. So the practical experience is that gradient descent against gradient descent has a hard time converging, let alone to a meaningful solution. So the overarching questions for this talk are why gradient descent struggles in the multi-agent front, given that it didn't struggle in the single agent front. So in the single agent front, we had the guarantee that gradient descent would eventually settle at the local optimum. Why is it that it has this unstable behavior in the multi-agent setting, even in zero-sum settings like GANs in generated other cell networks? Second question, maybe perhaps more philosophical what are you know in, in view of the fact that there are no Nash equilibria in these non-convex settings what are even the right optimization targets that we should recommend deep learners in this kind of settings try to find and are these things practically attainable and finally, like, remember, I, I you know, like I, I was saying that, you know, like in, in single agent deep learning, there was a very co concrete framework of what you ought to do in this kind of scenario, like write down a complex model, collect a lot of data, find access to a supercomputer, run gradient descent. It was a, it was a fixed framework, right? That, you know, people in academia and industry can appeal to. Over here, you know, gradient descent doesn't work. So what, what is the, what would be a nice multi-agent deep learning framework? These are the overarching questions. Let's try to think about them. First, let's write a concrete model. So I'm, you know, so for the rest of the talk, I'm imagining the setting where you have N agents. Every agent has to choose a parameter vector and every agent has a utility function or a loss function. It's the same thing up to a minus sign. Okay, so they want to maximize the utility function or they want to minimize the loss function, whatever. It's the same thing. What makes this a game is that the utility of an agent depends on what they do and what the other people are doing. So that's what makes it a game. Um, now, the features that we're interested in are the following. The strategies of the agents are high dimensional. They may be imposing constraints on each other. So let's let's call calligraphic S the constraints on what strategies can go together. Think of it as you know, like if you know one robot is producing one kilos of, of potatoes then the other uh, robot can buy at most one kilos of potatoes. They cannot buy more than the potatoes that the other robot produces, right? So there are constraints that are constraining the actions, the strategies that, are, that this group of agents can jointly choose. And importantly, the utility functions that agents are trying to maximize are non-concave, which is the same as saying that the loss functions that uh, the agents are trying to minimize are non-convex in their own decisions. And this is the big departure from game theory. In game theory, we, we, we like thinking of games where the utility that every agent is trying to maximize is concave in their own actions. AKA the loss that every agent is trying to minimize is convex in their own actions. Here we are departing from that model. 
we, and we have to, because as I was saying, in deep learning applications, the utility functions are very funky. So we want to think explicitly about games where the utilities are not necessarily concave in somebody's own actions. Also, we oftentimes will be thinking about games where agents have very poor access to their utilities. First, zero order or first order? Like if you're a robot who's controlling their joints and fighting against another robot, you know, maybe you can locally check, you know, if you can improve your policy by, by tweaking it, that would be a zero order uh, uh, access to your utility, right? You try policies nearby your policies, see if they improve, if they don't improve, you stay put, okay? This, this would be a, a zero order access to your utility. You know, if, you, if you're like here, you maybe have first order access, but like higher order access gets more expensive. And also, if we're lucky, we, you know, at least our utilities are ellipses and smooth, at least almost everywhere. Okay. These are the types of games I'm interested in. And I'm going to be calling those games non concave games or smooth non concave games if you also have the, the smoothness and differentiability. Okay. These are the games we're interested in. It and these are games that are naturally defined by these deep learning applications. Custis, can I uh, pause the yeah. question? Um, so I think the first uh, tool like are very sensible in the in terms of like deep learning. Uh, how should we think about Lipschitzness? Because if you are taking like some of these um, you know deep models as or utility or loss functions, then uh, the Lipschitz constants can um, be potentially uh, large, right? So yeah. Yeah, so let's not put a number on these lips. First of all, like uh, typically you're going to be lips, it's almost everywhere, not everywhere. Uh, and smooth almost everywhere, not everywhere. So yeah, so like this is to say these are not horrible, but uh, not to say that you have a nice lips uh, constant. Chances are, you know, like these functions are very funky and you shouldn't like, you shouldn't, um, yeah, like you shouldn't hope that lip distance of smoothness is going to save you in any way. Like it's not like you're going <laughs> to discretize your space <laughs> and uh, you're going to have a small cover of all possible, you know, choices and so on and so forth. Yeah. So let's not, uh, yeah, let's not appeal to smoothness or lip distance too much. You're right. That's a, that's a great comment. These are high dimensional strategy spaces and these utilities are, we should not think them as very nice indeed. Any other questions? Any questions from the class? Uh, there's a question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So my question is uh, sort of okay. Sorry. So my question is almost the same as from just like uh, because at large uh, gradient step sizes, uh, the loss landscape that the model sees is very different. So how 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 to even think of continuity? when gradient step is finite. Because if step size is too large, then the, if, uh, the network is seeing a very coarse screen. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess, you know, like we, um, I guess since we haven't thought about how the gradients are used, uh, I think this is sort of like an open-ended kind of question. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, as you know better than me, you try a lot of different learning rates and so on and so forth in the hopes that, you know, you make big jumps or smaller jumps. So let's me, let's us not uh, drill into that right now because uh, I haven't said uh, uh, how gradients might be used, but yeah, I mean, this, this point is uh, well made, right? I mean, uh, if I wanna, let's say, uh, check the optimality or the local optimality of my current choices, you know, like, yeah, like, uh, should I look at the gradient and, and make what kind of steps, big steps, small steps, what is the right thing? That is in the end, you know, like your call, I guess, uh, but uh, in, in how you are gonna use uh, this gradient. So I think it, this question might actually become pertinent uh, later on during the, 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 the lecture. Uh, and, you know, like it's, a, it's an important philosophical question and let's, let's you know, let, let, let's revisit it when we come to it. Great, great. It, it, will be, it will be relevant later on, yeah. So I don't see any more questions. Cool. So this is the type of, abstractly speaking, the type of models we are interested in. 
And of course, you know, like, let me give a, <clears throat> some examples of what it may capture from deep learning and outside of deep learning. So of course, you know, like this thing captures uh, generated by the serial network because, you know, like there you have two players, so n equals two, you know, so the generator player has a large vector of parameters, um, uh, the same does the discriminator and, you know, like the utility functions are expressing how well the generator is fooling the discriminator and vice versa. It's a, a generator of serial network is a two player zero sum uh, game uh, and it is a non-concave game, you know, because you know the utilities of the players are very, of course non-concave in their own actions. So that's definitely we capture that. We also capture classical things, right? So we capture normal what are called normal form games in game theory, going back to von Neumann and Nas and even before them to Emil Borel. Uh, in normal form games the strategies of the agents are distributions over a discrete set of actions. So, uh, you know, uh, the XIs are points in a, in a simplex uh, whose corners correspond to discrete uh, actions. So these XIs represent distributions over a discrete set of actions. And, and the utilities uh, given a collection of, uh, you know, XIs, which is a collection of randomized strategies is just the expected payoff. Like, so you, you know, you have every agent has a utility function that is defined on, only for discrete choices of agents. And you just take uh, the expectation of, of that utility function uh, with respect to the product measure defined, assuming that every agent is independently using their own distribution to sample uh, from their set of discrete actions. So, this case definitely falls under our framework uh, for the fact that, okay, like it satisfies all this, but, but, but you know, like in fact, the utility here is, is in fact linear in an agent's own action. So uh, yeah, that, I mean, <laughs> it is in fact a concave game, this game that I wrote down here, right? So, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, that is to say that my class is much bigger than, you know, like the, the games that are classically studied in game theory where you have a multilinear function, in fact. Uh, another example of the types of games that are that are contained in my class is the classical Arrow de Bray, uh, you know, like uh, uh, general equilibrium uh, model. Uh, and in fact, uh, if I allow non-concavity, uh, I allow to contain uh, economies that don't actually fo fall under the, the, the model that Arrow de Bray wrote down and in particular in uh, this general equilibrium theory developed by these two guys and those that came after them or before them it is typically assumed that the producer has a convex cost function for producing more stuff this convexity is there in the cost function is that so that their utility is concave in their actions but this convexity in the cost, in the production cost, does not bode well with economies of scale, which are, of course, a very important setting. So, in economies of scale, the more you produce, eventually you become your cost function becomes concave. So, your utility, which is minus your cost, is actually non-concave. So, uh, you know the types of games that I wrote down, in fact, allow you to contain economies of scales, which um, are not. Uh, uh, are not uh, covered by the classical Arrow de Bre uh, uh, model. Okay, so that's important. That's another uh, interesting case. Mm -hmm. So let me plug in my laptop. Sorry, I realized that I'm almost out of battery. One moment. All right, so. You know, I contain a lot of interesting stuff from machine learning, you know, game theory, economies, uh, general equilibrium theory, and so on and so forth. And even things that, you know, cannot be, the, you know, modeled by the standard models. But there is an issue. <laughs> uh, and the issue is that uh, I've already pointed out this issue is that without concavity of utilities, aka convexity of losses, equilibria are not guaranteed to exist. And that's not hard to see, okay? So here's a silly game where equilibria 
already failed to exist. Imagine a two player zero sum game where one player is choosing a number x1, another player, the other player is also choosing a number x2. The utility of the first player is their distance squared. The utility of the other player is minus that. No matter the number that people choose, like if they're equal, player one wants to get the hell you know, out of there, okay? If they're different, player two wants to go and match player one. This game doesn't have equilibria. There's no pair of numbers so that no player wants to deviate, which is the Nash equilibrium condition. So the games that are defined do not have Nash equilibrium. So that's a problem. Now, an answer in quotes, I'll put it in quotes that game theorists would give in this kind of scenario is to say, look, you know, since equilibria failed to exist, let us consider distributions over uh, strategies, right? I mean, Rather than thinking of like in this game, right? So agents choosing uh, numbers, thinking, think of them as choosing distributions over numbers in the hopes that equilibrium exists if you look at distributions. But that's not an answer that is satisfactory for many reasons. One is in this kind of games, um, equilibrium is not guaranteed to exist unless you place some you know, compactness and other structural assumptions on the utility function. The strategy space and the utility functions. And also, like if they even if they do exist, they typically have very large supports. And this is definitely not practical for like deep learning, right? So, like in a generator serial network, I wouldn't want to have a mixture for over, over a million of generators and a mixture over a million of discriminators that are supposed to be in equilibrium against each other. Right? It wouldn't be practical. Maybe I could stomach uh, having a small support. Maybe I, I could stomach that, but definitely, you know, like like uh, considering mixtures is not going to save the day. Okay, so that's not a good answer to this question. So we really have to face the problem for what it is: the fact that equilibria don't exist. And this is what motivates my overarching questions here, right? So like. If equilibria, if the, if the classical notions that game theory defined for us do not exist, the classical equilibrium concepts like Nash equilibrium, correlated equilibrium, whatever, if they fail to exist, then what are meaningful solution concepts that TensorFlow would uh, you know, target with its optimization methods, yeah? And are they practically attainable? Meaning, can they be, uh, you know, reached via some light method, lightweight method like uh, uh, gradient descent, right? So what, like my, my vague desiderata for a meaningful solution concept is that they, they should at least always exist, okay? So like, you know, Nash equilibrium is not it because it doesn't, it's not guaranteed to exist. So some, I want something, right? So if I, I wanna have a realistic target, that does exist in every uh, multi-agent deep learning interaction. So this should definitely not be Nash equilibrium because it fails to exist. So what is it? it? Must be universal. It should be verifiable with the info that people have, right? So like if agents only have first act, first order access to their utilities, then they should be able to verify that they are at the solution with the access that they have. Otherwise, you know, what am I even saying? Like, uh, if you need, you know fifth order information to verify that you're there, uh, then okay, like it's not meaningful to propose that as a solution concept because, you know, maybe you don't have five, fifth order access to the utilities, right? So I want them to, I want them to always, like I want to, I want to propose a solution concept that is guaranteed to exist in all possible multi-agent deep learning settings and uh, I want it to be verifiable with information that agents have about their utilities. I want them to be able to understand that they have reached, you know, my solution concept if they have indeed reached it. 
And also, ideally, I would like it to be practically attainable. I would like simple methods, maybe some variation of gradient descent to allow me to get to that uh, solution. So these are my desiderata. Existence, verifiability, and uh, you know, attainability. So how do we, what is a reasonable proposal? The first thing you would like to do is to say, look, you know, I mean, in the single agent world, we made this conceptual shift from global optima to local optima. Over here, I mean, over there, it's not like we made that shift because global optima didn't exist, right? So in a single agent problem, global optima do exist, but the reason we made the conceptual shift from global optima to local optima was that, you know, global optima finding them is empty hard. So we said, okay, like, forget about that. Let's try local optima, which can be reached with gradient descent. That was the reason there. It was not because global optima didn't exist, but because we wanted something practical. Over here, we have a bigger issue, right? Like the global notions of equilibrium don't exist. So now it's even of a bigger necessity to, to switch to something else, but we can follow the same paradigm and say, okay, like, look, what happened there? We went from global to local optima. Let's do the same here. So here's a notion of local Nash equilibrium that we could entertain. Uh, that is to say, a point, a selection of strategies, X1 star, X2 star, Xn star, is a local Nash equilibrium. If every player I plays an Xi star that is a local best response to what the other guys are doing, namely, if player I looks at their utility function, fixing what the other guys are doing, then Xi star is a local maximum of that utility function. Might not be the global maximum of their utility given what the other guys are doing, which would be a Nash equilibrium if that was satisfied. Like if I, if I kill this word, if I remove local from here, that is the definition of Nash equilibrium. Uh, and, and, and you're like, rather than going for Nash equilibrium, which as I said, do not exist, I wanna just put a local in there <laughs> in the hopes that this thing does exist, right? So what I want is a collection of strategies for my N agent so that every agent is doing a local max, is playing a local max of their utility. If you fix what the other guys are doing. So this, guy, this X minus I is a very nice shorthand that game theorists like to use, which says, I look at this vector here. I fix the strategies of everybody except person I. I keep it fixed and then look at the utility of person I as they vary their known strategy. If Xi star is a local max of this function, then I declare victory. Okay. If everybody declares victory, then that's a local Nash. Now, local Nash is a vague term, it can mean a lot of things. Uh, so depending on how you instantiate it, you can get different notions of local Nash equilibrium. The babyest version, like the, uh, of how to instantiate it is to say a first order local max. So what is the first order local max? The first order local max is a local max with respect to the first order Taylor approximation to their utility function, if you fix the other guys. Okay, so this is the, a attempt at a local notion of optimality in the multi-agent world. Now let's let's try to unpack this, right? This definition. So what does it mean for an agent I to play uh, a, I guess, sorry, I should remove this local max. It's a max with respect to the first order Taylor approximation. What does it mean for a player I to play a max with respect to the first order Taylor approximation of their utility, where, oh, this didn't work well. So basically, uh, each agent must find themselves in one of two scenarios, okay? Let me use this symbol here to represent the constraints 
that agent, the other agent strategies impose, so remember calligraphic S was the uh, constraints of the joint strategies of all the players, SI of X minus I is the constraints that other people impose on me, right? So we see what the goods they produced and now I have to buy the bundle that I like. So they impose some constraints on me. Now, what I'm doing for, for, for my strategy XI star to be a maximum for the first order uh, tailor approximation to my utility function, I must find myself in one of two scenarios. Let's consider the, the, the right scenario first. Either where I'm playing, my gradient is zero. So first order Taylor tells me, hey, you know, you're playing optimally as far as I'm concerned, right? So if the gradient is zero, first order Taylor is happy, says, you know, you're playing optimally. The other scenario is that XI star is on the boundary of the constraint set. And if the agent would, like, would, would try to uh, improve their utility by, by uh, a gradient step, that would take them outside. And if they were to project back, they would land where they started, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, that's another, I got disconnected from my power. Uh, that's another case where you are happy. So you are happy, XI star is a best response to what the other guys are doing as far as first order Taylor is concerned, if one of these two scenarios holds. And I can summarize these two scenarios in this way. What does it say? It says, start where you are, do a grade instead, project to the constraints. If you land where you started, there's just nothing you can do as far as first order Taylor is concerned. So first order local Nash, is basically effectively a fixed point of gradient descent against the gradient descent, which is what practitioners basically have been trying to find with, uh, the, at least it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the fixed point of the dynamics that practitioners are running in things like GANs. So this is what first order uh, local Nash is. It's the first attempt at coming up with a local notion of a local solution for games in this setting. And I compactly wrote it as this. Does it make sense? So uh, a strategy for every player so that no player can improve if they do a, a grade instead. Custis, uh, I'm thinking uh, about your uh, previous example, the quadratic utility, x1 uh, minus x2 squared. Would this uh, uh, resolve that uh, issue that we didn't have like the equilibrium in that case? Uh, so in that case, uh, if x1 is equal to x2, that is a local Nash. And the reason for that is that the, in that case, if x1 equals x2, the gradient of both people is zero. I see, yeah. Right? So, so you, we, we can discuss, is that meaningful or not? Do we like that you know x1 equals x2 is a local Nash? Uh, that's a different question, but... It is, it, 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 you know, that would be a local Nash in that case. Yeah, makes sense. The gradient of this function is zero if x1 equals x2 for both players. So both players will say, oh, you know, first order Taylor is happy where we are. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. So now, okay, like, but the, okay, like, I guess, you know, like I defined the notion, right? I didn't say anything about whether it exists. Like, did I achieve any goal at all? So the first thing to actually, so the reason I this because of this discussion is that this thing does exist at least. If your constraint set is compact and convex, you have this guarantee now. Okay, again, global NAS doesn't exist. This thing, this first order local NAS does exist. So going after it, is not unreasonable because at least it exists. All right. Any question? Uh, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, optimization problems like the end, is it set delta the whole space or is it what, what, what would delta be? So the question is about delta. Yeah, like is it generally uh, like for things like the end, isn't it the whole space or is it also like, like a boundary? Uh, so, sorry, what is delta? 
Oh, you mean this calligraphic S? Oh, uh, I mean, I don't know. You you guys know Gans probably better than me, but like, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like maybe, you know, like, like, like in, um, in Gans, maybe like, uh, you know, you put some constraints on all the parameters of like, like you assume that every parameter is in some range, you know, minus 10 to plus 10 or whatever. And, you know, like you have a box. These are box constraints These are like in GANs, there are not like in GANs, my st like the generator strategies don't influence what uh, the discriminator is allowed to do or vice versa. So you have a simpler uh, constraint set in that case. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. So the constraints in that case are not but yeah, like in a the market, they are more complex because, you know, again, as I was saying earlier, like if I produce certain things, then the buyers cannot buy more than I produce and so on and so forth. But, but in GAMS, it's a more simple set. Also, like, let me make one comment since we're here. Like, okay, like here I have been entertaining this idea of like first order local nouns where every player is playing a best response. Uh, to the others, as far as the first order tailor is concerned. I could, of course, consider second order local NAS, asking that every player is playing a best response to the others, as far as the second order tailor of his utility is concerned, and so on and so forth, third order, and fourth, and fifth, and sixth, etc. Unfortunately, the moment you step away from first order, it stops, this proposition stops holding. And you already know an example of that. What is it? Quadratic one, right? Quadratic. So in quadratic, second order does nothing. It leaves it as is, right? So a second order of the quadratic leaves it quadratic. And in that game, even if you make the, the set of strategies compact and convex, like if you have players playing in the plus minus one or whatever, uh, you can easily see that there's like no, like, like, you no, know, second order local NAS are the same as global NAS because second order uh, doesn't do anything to the utility. So, um, and, and you know, there's no equilibrium. So, so but effectively, like, first order local NAS is the only thing that I can guarantee exists. The moment you are more demanding, you have to place constraints on your problem for this to actually have those things. But you know, even that this little quadratic thing breaks it. So, uh, you know, so that's one comment I wanted to make. Uh, yeah, uh, what other comment did I want to make? Um, oh yeah, the other comment I want to make is okay. Like this proposition shouldn't come as a surprise, right? I mean, like if if you look at the definition of my notion. This very much looks like a fixed point equation. I mean, you know, like I want, you know, the vector of X stars to be equal to a function of the X stars. If I manage to argue that this, this map is uh, Lipsitz, it's like continuous or whatever, then, you know, the existence of uh, a fixed point follows from Brouwer's theorem. So, you know, like this is effectively what's happening in the proof. Um, yeah, so the proof, I guess, needs that uh, the utility is smooth so that you know this thing is continuous and it needs uh, convex the compactness of the set so that this projection is also a continuous map but yeah this you know i guess i should say that i need smoothness of the uis for this to actually exist Has this, there, is a, there is a question sorry in the chat but the direct message. Oh, direct message. Uh, I don't uh, see. It. Excuse, excuse me. Say, say, Sahel. Sorry. Uh, I, I could. I, I don't see it because it's a yeah, direct. Yeah, message. yeah, yeah. Uh, what if S? So the constraint set is non-convex, and if you're not able to solve it using the first order. Yeah, I mean, if S is not convex, all bets are off. I don't know. You know, I, I don't even know. I, I don't even have a proposal of what you should do in that case, okay? So that uh, opens up uh, a discussion about what we should even target, okay? Uh, at least when S is convex and compact, uh, you know, like I know that at least this first order local NAS exists. So it is universal and it is verifiable with the info that people have. 
so that that's a good thing about first order local Nash. But okay, like I, I, I'm not kind of like saying that this is what we should be doing. Like I'm saying, like this is something that we could be doing. I'm not saying that this is what we should be doing because you know, like you know, even in this quadratic example, it says like you know, like everything that x one is equal to x two is a local Nash equilibrium. Okay, are you happy with this? It's unclear if you should or should not be happy. But at least it's universal and verifiable. All you need is first order access to your utility to verify. The other desideratum though was, is it practically attainable? And here there is this suspicion that, you know, like PIP practitioners are struggling. Like, I mean, like, you know, like first order NAS really captures the fixed points of running gradient descent against gradient descent. And we already have this experience that gradient descent struggles to converge uh, in uh, uh, these settings. So is there an explanation for of that phenomenon? Um, and uh, here is an explanation of this phenomenon, joint work with uh, Stratisco, Likes, and Manoli Zambatakis. Even if you consider two player and zero sum and smooth, even if it's, the game is smooth, non concave games, any method that accesses the utilities through first order queries, so value queries, gradient value queries, We'll have to make exponentially many queries to compute even an approximate uh, first order local Nash equilibrium, right? So even if you were going for this very non-demanding notion of equilibrium, this first order local Nash, which at least is guaranteed to exist, even but even if your game is two player and zero sum like a gun game you would struggle in general you would struggle like that, that there are examples there are you know uh, there are bad examples where it would take exponential time to arrive at a local even even a local nash equilibrium so that's exactly that's a claim number one Claim number two is that even if you have higher order access to your utility, even in fact, if your utility is given explicitly to you, uh, you would have to make super polynomial number of steps uh, to compute such a thing in the same setting as two players or some games, non-concave games, unless some complexity theoretic assumption breaks. So, 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 sorry, unless, right, uh, unless a collapse happens, a complex theoretic collapse happens. So, uh, uh, right, so I guess the previous result was unconditional. It said, you know, like, you don't need to believe any complex theory. I can, I can prove to you that you need exponentially many steps to compute first order local Nash equilibria. <clears throat> the second result says, subject to the complex theoretic assumption that, you know, <coughs> The class P part does not collapse to the class P. Uh, even if you had higher order access to the utility, you could still need super polynomial number of steps. So there's a big difference between local optima and local Nash equilibria. Uh, local optima in single agent optimization problems can be computed in polynomial time. Local optima, so local Nash equilibria in multi agent games, even if they're two zeros, two players zero sum, they're very hard. This is the point of the lecture. And in the, I don't know how much time do I have? Uh, I, I want to wrap it up. Is we that have, the, we have oh. the room uh, 445, uh, but like, oh. yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, so wanna, I want to give you like a hint of intuition about why this complexity result holds and kind of like conclude with some open directions if you want to like think about problems in this area, which I think is a productive thing to do. Okay, so the first thing I want to convince you about kind of like at least at an intuitive level is why is it that finding local optima in single agent non-convex problems is something that we can do efficiently 
And the moment we go one baby step away, I mean, baby, so one step away, which is the most, the, 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 you know, the second hardest problem after single agent is two agent zero sum. Why is it like already there we hit complexity barriers? Yeah. I want to give you some intuition about that. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I, I want to do it in pictures. <laughs> so I want to consider, I want to do this comparison. I want to, I want to compare what happens in a single agent non-convex minimization, AKA non-concave maximization problem. If you run an algorithm that tries to find local improvements and you follow such a local improvement path versus if you're considering a two player zero sum game and you wanna, and you consider a sequence of improving moves for the two players of the game. And I wanna illustrate that the improving paths, if you have one agent are very different from the improving paths if you have two agents interacting. And here's how they're very different. So in this picture here, I'm considering an agent who's controlling, controlling moves both in the horizontal and in the vertical axis. And they have a utility, they have a function, a loss function that they wanna minimize. And I'm showing you local improving steps that the, this single agent is taking. And I'm tracking the objective function as they are taking these local improvement, improving steps. So here, here's what could happen, right? In the objective function as the agent is improving, that the objective function has to go down. This is what it means to be improving, right? So you have a single agent, they only take a step if that would improve their objective function, or better go down if they're minimizing, right? In fact, if, if the agent doesn't take tiny steps, but only will only take a step if it's reasonably large, in this case, at least one point of improvement, and if there is a global lower bound on the objective, maybe because you're optimizing a compact set, so you know your f has a global mean. Like if you're making big steps and there is an absolute lower bound, eventually you can't be moving. This is why gradient descent works. This is really like okay, like there is, there is some math you have to do, but the the reason why gradient descent works in single agent non-convex optimization is that as you're taking improving steps, you're chipping away distance to the absolute, the global minimum of your function. Which is you know, what I'm summarizing here and what I just wrote. Okay, switching gears, let's think about what happens in a two player zero sum game. Now I'm gonna consider two agents. One is controlling moves, the minimizing player controlling moves along the horizontal axis. There's one objective, one wants to minimize it, one wants to maximize it. The minimizing player moves horizontally, the maximizer player moves vertically. And I, I'm tracking the objective values of, of, the, of the minimizing player's function, right? So, I mean, I'm tracking the objective value that the, the, they want to mean maximize, okay? So, uh, so I want to point, so, so here I'm showing two, how this may look like, how, how Im improvement trajectories may look like. The first thing I want to point out is that in a zero sum game, these trajectories need not be paths. In the single edge, it can be cyclic. So here on the upper right, I'm showing you a cyclic objective improving uh, 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 um, uh, sequence of moves. And what happens here is that, you know, like when the horizontal player moves, they decrease the objective function. When the vertical guy moves, they, it increases the objective function and so on and so forth. But it can be cyclic. You can repeat values. Uh, over here, the, the values, like if you're improving, the values have to go down all, all the way. Like the, you cannot repeat values. Over here, because there are two players, one minimizing, one up maximizing, 
you can actually repeat values and you get into cycles. Okay, so first of all, better response paths could be cyclic. Second point is that you can repeat values. So even, even if you're querying a path, a better response path that is not cyclic, the function value on that path doesn't reveal too much whether, you know, like this three is here, or is here, or is here, or is here, like how close to the end of the path it is. Even if the path is non cyclic, the function value on that path doesn't give you too much info about how far of the path you are. So there are two issues now, right? One, you know, you, you, you know, if you land somewhere in the state space and you start moving, you might find yourself in a cyclic path and you can, you can keep moving in cycles. Problem number one. Problem number two, even if you are lucky enough not to land on a cycle, the value of the objective where you landed doesn't give you much info, like doesn't give you info about where you are with respect to the endpoints of this path. So now these are the features of a bad case for you, right? The bad case scenario for you, because you know, you don't if you don't extract a lot of info from making queries at the objective function, I can then fool around. I can I, like I, I being the adversary who's answering these questions. I can force you to make a lot of questions before you actually find a local optimum. So, so kind of like intuitively to build a bad example, which you cannot do in the convex concave case, you cannot do it in, in, in concave games, but in a non-concave game, what you would like to do is you would like to hide such a, a very long such path with reshuffled values, like, like a space filling kind of path such that you know, if the algorithm asks queries about the objective or the gra its gradient along the path, it does not get in a lot of information out of you about where the local Nashes are. So this is intuitively what you'd like to do. Okay, so this intuition is basically captures what's going on. We weren't able to do this construction directly. So what we actually did is we first proved the hardness result, like the complexity theoretic result. Uh, and then uh, we, we exploited properties of that result to build our query complexity lower bound. Okay, so we couldn't, in principle, maybe, you, you know, if you're smarter than us, you can come up with such a construction without appealing to complexity theory. We had to do a lot of work on the complexity theory side to then inherit uh, some query lower bounds from other problems into our problem. In any event, long story short, okay, so what we showed is uh, this, right? So, you know, here's, you know, uh, uh, um, a capture of showing three complexity classes, P and NP, which you're familiar with. P contains things like linear programming. Uh, NP contains problems like traveling salesman, hard problems. PPAD, this class is in the middle between the two. And it captures problems like finding fixed points of, of Lipschitz functions or finding mixed Nash equilibria of general sum uh, uh, normal form games uh, in mixed strategies. So what we show is that, you know, like these non-convex, non-concave games that, that we're talking about, are as hard as any problem in this class. So they're exactly as hard as this class. So unless this class collapses down to P, uh, you cannot have a polynomial time algorithm that finds local Nashes. So local Nash in even two player zero sum games that are non-concave is as hard as bra fixed points, as hard as mixed Nash, uh, mixed global Nash in normal form games. This is what we showed and also the associated query complexity lower bounds. Philosophical corollary, in my view, based on the results I was talking about, this nice paradigm we followed in single agent deep learning cannot be generalized as, uh, you know, like uh, easily in the multi-agent deep learning world. And the reason is that, you know, like the nice notion of local optima does not have an analog uh, uh, it does have an analog, this local NAS thing, but that analog is, uh, you know, like is, 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 is computationally much more intractable. Where do we go from here? 
So I think we need, what that reveals in my mind is that in the multi-agent world, there's gonna be a lot more texture um, uh, uh, that, you know, that would require us to be more careful about how we model strategic interactions between robots, strategic interactions between robots and humans or whatever. And we have to do a lot more work in the modeling, understanding you know, features of our setting that you know, like could allow us to sidestep the intractability barriers. Uh, we should do a lot more work on like thinking about the right solution concepts. Maybe local NAS is a good one, but maybe local NAS is not satisfactory, right? I mean, you know, like in this X1 minus X1, X2 squared example, you know, saying that all X1 equals X2 is a local NASH, maybe it's not very nice. So, you know, like, you know, if you have more structure in your setting, maybe you can go after more demanding, maybe second order local NASHs or even global NASHs, okay? So, so, but in the moment you give more texture into your model, maybe you can sidestep these intractability results or the inexistence results and go after more demanding notions. And I think if you do that, you will have, you'll get more successes like AlphaGo and Libratus, uh, which importantly do use a lot of game theory uh, to attain uh, their goals, okay? Here are some directions that I am personally thinking about these days. Um, on the local Nash front, what I showed you is a complexity result. It's a worst case result. I told you that, you know, like there are hard instances uh, that can fool an algorithm to make exponentially many queries. But it's possible that you can come up with a nice algorithm that, you know, like exploits, you know, the local geometry of your function, where it's at, and, you know, in nice instances, converges practically fast. So this is one of the directions that we're considering. We have, this paper will be soon in the archive, we have a proposal of a second order method that exploits the local geometry of your objective uh, to guarantee convergence to a, a local Nash equilibrium and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, trying to exploit local structure of your function to, you know, to, you know telescope, you know, faster than, you know, standard methods that compute fixed points. Uh, another thing that I think is philosophically very interesting, but uh, you know, I don't know how to do very well, is, you know, like I mean, you know, like in normal form games, Nash equilibria are intractable, right? So Nash equilibria are pretty complete as well. In like, but these are global Nashes. In in uh, global Nashes in ni nice games, are also intractable. Here, local Nashes in local Nashes in bad games are intractable. We already knew that. Global NASs in good games are intractable. So over there, in, 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 you know, like in good games, because NASs were, are intractable, people have looked at other solution concepts like correlated equilibria, which are reachable with no regret learning, with online learning procedure. What I would like to do in this setting is I would like to develop a local notion of correlated equilibrium whose existence is not based on fixed point arguments, but, 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 but it's based on Lyapunov style arguments. And as a result, it doesn't come with the baggage of Brouwer, right? So the baggage of Brouwer is that if, your existence, if the existence of your solution is based on Brouwer, you're risking that it's also gonna be pretty hard to compute. Like if you had a nice notion of correlated, of local correlated equilibrium based on Lyapunov function arguments, maybe it would come with better computational properties as well, all right? And finally, you know, like I already mentioned that, you know, another thing to do is to consider games that are not as general, have a lot more structure, like extensive from games, or, you know, like multi-agent reinforcement learning settings uh, that, you know, have a lot more structure. And for this reason, it's more plausible that, you know, in fact, like, in fact, they have so much structure that global Nash equilibria exist, despite the fact that they're non-convex or concave games, they're not concave games, but global Nash equilibria exist because of the math structure that they have. And there's a lot of literature around how to compute this global Nash equilibria, global correlated equilibria and such in these games. I think, you know, there's a lot more work to be done in this frontier where you're, you're going after more demanding solution concepts 
because you put more structure in your game, right? So the first two bullets pertain to very general settings, but compromising on the solution concept. The last bullet pertains to, you know, considering compromising on the, uh, you know, generality of the games you're considering, but going after more demanding solution concept. Okay. That's basically all I wanted to talk about today. Here's a quick summary. Thank you very much, guys, for, for your attention. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, uh, Pastors, for, for such an amazing talk. So we have time for some questions. Um, one question. Uh, there's a question, just go ahead. Professor, when in the formulation you have said that one, what is the performance of one agent, given that all the agents are performing at their best? Does that, doesn't that uh, always convert to a Pareto optimal solution? Not the optimal solution? Uh, excuse me, I, I didn't miss, I, I missed some of the details of the question. Like, are you talking about the solution concepts that are defined or are you talking about some other solution, some other uh, solution concept? No, like uh, that you define in the uh, local Nash equilibrium, you have said that you are optimizing over one agent's performance, given that all the agents are performing at their best. So that doesn't that lead to a Pareto optimal solution and there will not be a optimal solution? Uh, so actually, even global Nash is not leading to Pareto optimal solutions, right? I mean, um, like, uh, you know, like what, you know, like this first welfare theorem, you have like, 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 in the, like, 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 like in the R de Brem model, you have things like that, but you don't have it even for global Nash is over here. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, mm -hmm. I have this question, right? So in deep learning, in like GANs, you know, other, you know, uh, problems that we have min max, the objective that we have is a little bit more specific than a general function, general utility function, right? Usually like the objective that we have is like expectation over some uh, empirical distribution. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have this uh, potentially a non, a linear function that may have more parameters than the number of samples that we have. Like basically, we may, you know, be yeah. in very particular uh, yeah. set of in terms of utility function. Do you think that maybe using some of the structure that you know the, the deep learning problem may impose may help us in terms of you know showing maybe you know in those situations maybe we are close to convex concave min max or uh, somehow. Uh, gradient descent ascent may converge to some good solutions in those situations. You know, there certainly have been works trying to explore that. Um, I believe you also have some paper around this now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, like, I mean, it's really like, uh, it's a, ultimately like it's a matter of like uh, how big of a proponent somebody is in the over on the over parameterized setting, right? And what it means. I mean, I guess for me to be satisfied, I mean, like, if we're talking really about GANs uh, and not like more abstractly about games motivated by GANs, but if we're really talking about GANs, what I would personally like to be able to claim is that the distribution that I actually learned, this platonic distribution that God is using, I, I really did successfully learn it. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, you can you can think about aspects of the geometry of the problem if you are over parameterize it. That's kind of like a different uh, question. Uh, but 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 ultimately, like 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 for my personal satisfaction, I would I would like to be able to say that okay, like if I over parameterize, I do learn the target distribution, or like you know like you know like another thing that I would be interested in. And again, there is some work by me and others on this is to say, look, you know, like imagine that God's distribution <laughs> looks like the architecture that I'm trying to train. Imagine, you know, like imagine God is using a gun of his own to generate things. And, you know, like I know the architecture that God is using. I don't know what parameter God is putting on his architecture or her architecture. Um, uh, you know, can I, uh, you know, would, you know, like, would I be able to figure out guns, uh, God's gun? Uh, you know, like if I define my discriminator correctly and so on so forth. So like, I guess for GANs, I personally am more interested in the statistical aspects, like uh, as well as the kind of like game theoretic, like I think like these go hand in hand, I guess, in, in, in my view, like 
uh, you know, one motivating the other and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, like, yeah. And in fact, you know, like for this reason, you know, like our joint paper was motivated by that uh, somehow, some, some, like in some sense, because, you know, over there we were interested in, you know, this high dimensional distribution. So we, and we wanted to define a game where the kind of like the statistical problems that arise for the discriminators involved in the process are actually simpler, pro simpler problems from a statistical point of view. So I think that this interaction of game theory with statistics in the, uh, in kind of like in the GAN framework is a very beautiful one. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. This time, uh, Costas, one more yeah. time.